We now turn to our first quantifications of distributions, measuring the center and measuring variability. Starting with center, a measure of central tendency is simply a number that represents the middle of a distribution. And we're all familiar with several different measures of central tendency, means, medians, and modes, all of which we saw in the distribution platform and jump. Now we're going to spend most of our time talking about the mean, although we will talk about situations in which the median and mode do provide nice and useful measures of central tendency, especially when we have heavily skewed data or data that is misbehaving in some other way. But starting with the mean, let's start with a definition in words of what the mean represents, and then we'll move on to how we would write this out in a formula. Now the mean is just the sum of a set of scores divided by the number of scores in the set. This is actually the arithmetic mean. There are other types of means we can talk about later, but the arithmetic mean is a simple one. Now we commonly call this the average, but in statistics we'll be more precise and specifically call this the mean. Now it's appropriate when we have interval or ratio scaled data, but the mean won't be appropriate for nominal or ordinally scaled data. Certainly with nominal data, simply categories in the environment, it wouldn't make sense to, and there's no possible way usually, to calculate a mean. However, for some ordinally scaled data, perhaps finishing place in the race, it may seem as though we can simply take a mean across those observations. However, remember with ordinal data, we're not sure that the distances between adjacent numbers or values actually represent the same distance in the construct. So the distance between first and second place and second and third could be quite different. This actually creates a problem when we're calculating a mean on these data, because the mean we obtain is not really the arithmetic center of the distribution. Now the mean takes on different symbols depending on what type of data we're working with. If we're working with population data, then taking the sum of scores divided by the number of scores in the set will actually return a value called mu. Mu is the Greek letter for the population parameter. On the other hand, if we're working with sample data and we take the sum of the scores divided by the number of scores we have, what we'll obtain is either m or x bar, depending on the notation you wish to adopt. In this class, we'll be using the bar notation, putting a bar over the name of the variable. So we can have x bar for the mean of the x variable, we could have y bar for the mean of the y variable, or z bar for the mean of the z variable. Now starting with the population mean, I'll keep the words here, the sum of the scores divided by the number of scores we have. This will quickly become cumbersome to write out the words for any formula we have. So in statistics, we simplify this and compress it down by using certain symbols. Now remember what the mean means as we go through this, because as we see some symbols, it may look less and less familiar. But remember, all we're doing is taking the sum of the scores divided by how many scores we have. So the way we would see this in statistical notation would be sum of the x's, so that's the sigma x, divided by capital N. Capital N here represents the size of a population. It's probably this top piece that you may not have seen before. And this sigma notation is called summation notation. This just says, take the sum of. Now let's step into this for a second because we're going to see sigma notation or summation notation quite a bit in this course. So let's start off with a very small data set, four scores, and these are all part of the x variable. Now to keep things clear, I'm gonna add one more column, an index column, and this is just an index number. So what this column does is simply count which observation in the variable of x we wish to talk about. All right, let's come back to sum of x. Now what does this actually write out or read out to be? Remember that the sigma there just means take the sum of. So this says take the sum of all the x observations, which literally says eight plus six plus seven plus nine or 30. All right, so let's use that i notation because this is how we'll actually see formulas, the sum of the x i's. Now this actually writes out to be sum of the x one, which is the first index of the x variable, x two, x three, and x four. And so again, we're given eight plus six plus seven plus nine or 30. Now notice with this I notation, we can be specific. We can say, take the sum of each individual X I minus five and then square that. Now note that the square actually refers to what's happening in the parentheses. So this gets written out as X one minus five squared, X two minus five squared and so on. If we write this out, this is then just three squared plus one squared plus two squared plus four squared, nine plus one plus four plus 16 which happens in this case to also again be 30. 
So the takeaway message here is that the summation notation is just a simple way for us to write out steps. And remember, all it means is take the sum of whatever operations follow the actual summation sign.